I'm only going to go back to uh, 1769. I just want to give everybody uh, a soup to nuts on where we, uh, how we got to Tesla. Uh, it goes back to steam. You know, people wonder why steam. Uh, a couple of obvious reasons that was available at the time. People understood it. It was straightforward to understand. It was simple to fuel. All you had to do was throw some briquettes or some wood in your vehicle. Uh, maximum torque at zero RPM. And it was powerful. Um, there are some examples of steam cars. They're all American. The 1903 Grout, what looks like a cow catcher in front of it, is actually part of the radiator system. Those are hollow tubes. Uh, don't worry. None of this is going to be on the final. So don't worry about it. Uh, why not steam? It's time consuming to start, get up ahead of steam, complicated to operate, difficult to maintain, hazardous if you don't maintain it properly, get exploding on you. Uh, high fuel consumption, both water and uh, the fuel to keep the water boiling. Uh, in other words, it was not convenient. People would do anything else but that. And then in Scotland in the uh, in late 1830, this guy named Robert Anderson said, Gee, I have a better idea. Let's do electricity. Uh, well, why electricity? Because it's clean, it's quiet, it's simple to operate, powerful. All the reasons we like it today. Now, it's a Morris and Salem electrobat. Um, it bears mentioning that one of the earliest uses of steam, pardon me, of electric was taxi cabs uh, and uh, predominantly in New York. New York had great streets. Nobody really needed to go that far. So uh, taxi cabs in the hands of the cab handsome cabs were the were pretty popular. Uh, there's the 1890 Parker. I'm showing you this because it's steered by reins. If you look at it, there's no steering wheel, there's no tiller. You picked up the leather straps and you went right or left. Um, and this is what uh, most people think of uh, back in the day when they thought of an electrical vehicle. Um, for the same reason it appealed to, to cabbies, it's the same reason it appealed to the gentrified set. Um, it was like a little phone booth on wheels. And if you look at the ad on the left for Baker, you can see the ladies with their enormous millinery, their gigantic hats, uh, and, the, and the woman uh, with their back actually to the windshield. So these, these cars were meant for you to sit in a little conversational grouping and have a, have a you know, smart, spirited, uh, ladylike discussion on your way to the Monday afternoon club or lunch or wherever you happen to want to go. Uh, the slide on the right shows the Frankenstein um, uh, laboratory charging mechanism in the day. It was really something. Uh, what was interesting about electric, it was either good for really light loads or re really heavy loads. Zero torque, pardon me, <laughs> maximum torque is zero RPM again, just like steam. Uh, in the 30s, um, gasoline was taking away from electric and people were turning away from electric cars and droves. Um, and they had to make them look more like gasoline cars to sell them. It didn't work. And in 1937-38, Detroit Electric um, was the last one, last major um, uh, electric manufacturer in uh, presence in America. Uh, ex well, why not electricity? All, all these reasons, expensive, it was heavy, light beam recharging time, short range, undersized associations, and inconvenient. Uh, another thing, nothing is convenient. Uh, not those two. Then came internal combustion. Why? Energy dense, easy to transfer, plentiful and inexpensive, both at first, not subsequently. Uh, it was familiar technology, people. It was approachable. All you needed was uh, spark, compression, and fuel, and you were on your way. Convenient, in other words. Mass production began. Ford innovates the assembly line um, in uh, 19, it was 1913. The moving assembly line, that is, and our thirst for fuel grows and grows. Um, eventually, um, we got a little hamstrung by World War II, and it led to some interesting adaptations. Uh, in Europe, fuel simply was not available, so they went to electric. Uh, electric always seems to have been the, the uh, go-to for uh, the default for any time there was uh, fuel shortages. Uh, one correction on this slide is the bottom left is a U court, not a David, for those who are keeping track. Uh, and I'd like to also mention that the 1940 Tortolina Electrica is probably being displayed without its batteries because those folk would not be able to pick it up otherwise. But you see how they, uh, even Toyota got into the game uh, early on. Uh, the Mille de Trieger. Uh, the bottom right, they even show them at the Concorde d'Elegance of the day, another uh, 
handful of uh, uh, brochures. Here's the CGE Compagnie um, General uh, Electric. Um, I'm, I'm massacring the pronunciation, so my apologies. Uh, Denka and Toyota, um, both, both from Japan. And meanwhile, this is what America thought electric cars would be good for. Just get around, you know, go to the store, do a little shopping. And you can still find these every so often. Um, time for a more sophisticated approach. I said, not that sophisticated. Uh, this is nuclear power. Um, how about, let's try this. Let's try taking a, an existing car and adapting it to electricity or building one from scratch, but still it needs to be small. General Motors said, well, wait a minute, we can get this electrical thing too. We'll just make ours a fuel cell instead of batteries. Well, forget the fuel cells, let's do batteries anyway. Uh, and then there were a couple of companies that came in and said, you know what, we're going to we're going to do this from the ground up. Ford came in and uh, General Electric uh, came in too, back to General Motors. And what you notice is these things are all small and they're really kind of weird looking. Uh, everything was rocking along. We didn't really take electric cars seriously until the, they turned off the fuel. Then diesel, and everybody thought, well, the Oldsmobile diesel introduced in 1978, that was going to solve our problems. Uh, electrical uh, vehicles were marketed widely. The Golf was electric. Uh, the Sebring Vanguard, that was a guarded uh, in the United States as a tour de force in its day. General Motors said, oh, okay, well, we better get back in this game. Uh, you see the car on the right. That's how they refueled it. It's just, it was super simple. All you did was take the back bumper off and then you slide out your um, battery pack, introduce another one. They said, well, you know, let's hedge our bets a little. Let's go for um, uh, hybrids, uh, which wasn't the first time. The, vehicle at the bottom left is one of only two loaner Porsches known as Survive. If you look at the front uh, wheel hub motors, uh, you'll notice uh, that there's probably a tremendous amount of unsprung weight on that car, but it, we're lucky it survives. It's still only one of two. How about a tribrid? This is electric, um, but it's battery electric and it's solar electric, and it's also wind powered because that um, curved structure at the top is actually a sail. Prices suddenly went down, big goes back, then gas prices went up, and up, and up, and up, and up. And eventually, uh, we went back to small cars. Um, internal combustion engines can only be so advanced. So now what do you do? You're, you know, you've got, um, you got some decisions to make. You're gonna go back to human power. It's not really for everybody. Uh, going back to wind power, uh, not every circumstance is ideal. You go to spring power, you have to think about who's gonna wind it. You go to compressed air, how are you going to carry enough air? There's all these things to consider. Atomic power, well, what if there's an accident? You know, you've got a, a world of hurt. Um, then you return to combustible, combustion engines and you think, well, no, been there, done that. We need something. We need something more interesting. Now, what do we do? Back to electric. First of all, try to retrofit mass produced cars to the electric power plants. The Toyota RAV4, all electric, uh, has a, uh, in this image, it's attached to a long ranger hybridizing trailer, what you would call it. It's kind of like a, um, uh, a vegan that secretly eats meat. Uh, and then the Chevrolet S10 uh, on the right, it's just a regular everyday Chevrolet that used the technology of the EV1. Here's Ford EcoStar electric van. Again, they took a European vehicle because it was small and they uh, superimposed electric power on it. And then they think, well, let's just design a holistic electric vehicle. Let's design something electric from scratch so that all the pieces fit. And you can imagine how a car like this would have gone over on the mass market. In other words, not well. Um, so they said, well, let's get one that's actually marketable. How about that for an idea? Uh, so General Motors came out with the EV1. And uh, because of a lot of reasons, corporate inertia, um, uh, um, liability problems and, and whatnot. General Motors said, okay, that was fun. Give me back our, um, our EV1s and uh, we'll, we'll rethink this. Meanwhile, there was a startup um, produced, pardon me, um, developed by a fellow named Elon Musk, who said, you know what? I'm going to develop the world's um, first sophisticated, modern, holistic electric car, and it became time to pass the baton. That's our logo, by the way. Autom 
Yeah. <laughs> so Leslie brings us up to the point where I come in. Let me uh, share my screen. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Tesla's history um, and its impact on the automotive world through the lens of our exhibition uh, at the Peterson Automotive Museum called Inside Tesla, Supercharging the Electric Revolution, which opened in November of 2022 and runs through March of 2024. The exhibition traces the company's story from startup to EV juggernaut. It explores the range of its products, its manufacturing capabilities, and its impact on the modern transportation landscape uh, outlining how in just about two decades, the company has succeeded in disrupting an industry that is more than 130 years old, as Leslie outlined. Um, let's see. Uh-oh, looks I'm having some trouble. There we go. So the exhibition traces the story from Tesla's beginnings, even prior to the arrival of Elon Musk. On display in the exhibition, we have the vehicle that essentially sparked Tesla's story, the AC Propulsion T0. AC Propulsion uh, created uh, electric drive systems in a small town in Southern California, San Dimas, California. Elon Musk has said that without the T0, Tesla either wouldn't exist or would have started much later. Three T0 sports cars were built by AC Propulsion between 1994 and 98, and in 2003, the car's original lead-acid batteries were replaced by lithium-ion batteries, which proved advantageous in terms of weight reduction, performance, and range. Manufacturing challenges thwarted plans for series production of the T0, as a matter of fact, the fellows at AC Propulsion weren't really even interested in series production of the T0. It had been more of an experiment for them. But a group of Silicon Valley engineers, including Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarpening, founded Tesla for the purpose of building a comparable vehicle in larger numbers. So Tesla was incorporated in 2003, and it began looking for investors. Enter Elon Musk, who incidentally attended uh, Queen's College in Kingston, Ontario in 1990. Um, he was intrigued by the promise of EVs after a test drive in the T0, and he became Tesla's largest shareholder and the chairman of its board of directors in February of 2004. Tesla's first offering was the Roadster with a prototype unveiled in 2006. The vehicle served primarily as a proof of concept for the company and a way to test the public's appetite for EVs. In first constructing the Roadster, a Lotus Elise, which you can see there on the left, was reconfigured with an AC propulsion drive system to create the first test mule, Mule 1. For the production Roadster, Tesla contracted Lotus to build the car's chassis, and though based on the drive system of the T0, the Roadster ultimately utilized Tesla's own motor drivetrain and charging system. The Roadster entered production in 2008 as the first highway legal all electric production vehicle to use lithium ion battery cells. The vehicle on the right here is the first production example that was delivered to Elon Musk in February, 2008, and he used that as his daily driver. Between 2008 and 2012, four versions of the Roadster would be built, helping Tesla establish themselves in the automotive industry, gain recognition and experience, and to develop its next vehicle, the Model S. So the next and most important step in Tesla's EV re revolution was the introduction of Model S. It debuted in prototype form in March 2009 at the SpaceX facility in California, which is also where it was designed. They have an office there. The Model S was pivotal in bringing all electric power to the broader automotive market. It's regarded today as one of the most influential vehicles since the Ford Model T. Although many automakers had attempted to reignite widespread interest in EVs since they fell out of favor in the early 20th century, and Leslie covered some of those attempts, it was not until Model S 
that consumers once again recognize the promise and the viability of cars powered, powered purely by electricity. The Model S was the first Tesla designed and engineered as an EV from the ground up, and it gained recognition as being both cutting edge and practical for everyday use. Its design, which is instantly recognizable, also helped Tesla establish a brand image and cement the firm's place in popular culture. The road to Model S was not an easy one. During the global financial crisis of 2008, Tesla struggled to fund production and the project was plagued by delays and cost overruns, um, even as Elon Musk took over as CEO of the company. Fortunately, in June, June 2009, the US Department of Energy provided Tesla with massive low interest loans. And in 2010, Tesla opened its factory in Fremont, California. Model S deliveries began in June 2012, six months after production of the Roadster ended. Model S quickly cemented its place in history, as I said, as the first successful mainstream market EV designed and engineered by an American company since the 1930s. Um, it was named Motor Trends Car of the Year for 2013. It was the first vehicle without an internal combustion engine to uh, hold that title. The vehicle we're looking at here was flown to New York City, uh, where Elon and Franz von Holzhausen accepted the uh, trophy, which you can see to the right. Behind the car is uh, a 2015 Model S dual motor chassis and drivetrain. Unlike the earlier Roadster, which housed its battery pack and electric components behind the seats, the Model S integrated a flat battery pack into the floor as a fortified and integral component of its chassis, which is uh, part of Tesla's uh, design architecture to this day. Now, one thing that has made EV owners, uh, potential EV owners wary of making the switch to all electric is of course, range anxiety. This is especially in uh, an issue in locations with colder climates like Canada, where battery life can be drastically diminished by cold weather. Tesla attempted to address this problem with a twofold approach. First, by building vehicles with enough range to cover nearly all daily trips, and second, by developing a network of fast charging stations along well-traveled routes. From the beginning, Tesla invested heavily in the technology and infrastructure to make sure there was access to fast and reliable charging for its vehicles on the road. In addition to the home wall connector and the portable mobile charger, Tesla also has a proprietary network of more than 36,000 superchargers in about 4,000 locations worldwide. In Canada, there are 1,490 superchargers across the country as of March 2023. There are also destination chargers installed by businesses like restaurants and hotels where you can charge on the go. This strategy of creating a charging infrastructure is unlike that of other EV automakers who have tended to focus more on building the vehicles themselves and less on establishing a network to support them. So this section of the exhibition looks at Tesla's charging options as well as its battery energy storage products like Powerwall and the big mega pack in the back there and also the solar energy generating solar roof tiles. We're getting back to the cars and Elon Musk master plan for Tesla, which was published in 2006 and outlined a path to help accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. The first step was to develop a premium low volume vehicle that would bring in enough profit to fund the development of a lower price medium vol volume vehicle. The profits generated from the sale of that vehicle could then be used to develop an even cheaper high volume vehicle. Oops, what's going on here? There we go. So following this strategy, the Tesla Roadster led to Model S and eventually to the Model 3. The Model S introduced EVs to a mainstream audience and served as the platform for Tesla's next vehicle, the Model X, which was introduced in 2012 and began production in 2015. The Model X is widely regarded as the world's first modern production all-electric SUV, 
and it had notable features like falcon wing doors and the world's largest panoramic windshield. Uh, model 3 is Tesla's most affordable model. It began production in 2017. On the first day, it received 135,000 reservations, prompting Bloomberg to declare the car unique in the 100-year history of the mass market automobile. In June of 2021, Model 3 became the best-selling EV ever, with global sales passing 1 million units. And lastly, there's Model Y, which began production in 2020. It's Tesla's midsize SUV. It borrowed substantially from the Model 3, but features a roomier interior and added versatility. Today, Model Y is among the world's best-selling cars by revenue. In July 2016, a decade after Elon Musk announced his master plan for Tesla, he revealed the company's next set of goals, the master plan part two. This new plan expanded the product line to reach all major segments of the market with the goal of producing an EV to meet most consumers' transportation needs. The exhibition looks at some of Tesla's forthcoming products, two of which, Tesla Semi and the Cybertruck, um, have already been realized since the exhibition's opening last year. Um, here we have Tesla unveiled um, the Roadster 2.0 in 2017, it's up there, the white vehicle on the left. It's designed for ultra high performance and potentially capable of more than 250 miles per hour. It was the first Tesla to utilize the company's tri-motor plaid powertrain, which many of you probably know is named for the high speed space travel in the Mel Brooks comedy Spaceballs. The Plaid platform features a layout in which one motor drives the front axle and two drive the rear, offering all-wheel drive and torque vectoring capability. Uh, in, 19, in 2019, Tesla debuted the Cybertruck pickup truck as its effort to bring electric power to a utilitarian platform historically dominated by gas-powered vehicles. Its distinct, distinctive stainless steel unibody referred to as its exoskeleton, makes it stronger than conventional body-on-frame designs. Um, after four long years, the first batch of a dozen Cybertrucks finally made it into the hands of eager customers on November 30th of this year. The exhibition features the deck model of Roadster 2.0 there, as well as the prototype of Cybertruck and the Cyberquad. And we will be displaying the bullet test cyber truck, which um, had a range of uh, guns fired at it to test the durability and strength of the steel panels, as well as Franz von Holzhausen's personal cyber beast cyber truck in the coming days. So that'll be very exciting uh, for visitors to the exhibition. At a 2016 shareholder meeting, Elon Musk stated that the competitive strength of Tesla long-term is not going to be the car, it's going to be the factory. This highlights Tesla's holistic approach to product design and manufacturing, which involves not only the vehicles, but also optimization of the machines that build the vehicles. Tesla is the only major automotive manufacturer today with in-house equipment design and build capabilities, enabling efficient and constant improvements to what Elon refers to as the machine that builds the machine. Um, at one time, Elon had envisioned a completely automated manufacturing process where the only role of humans would be to build the machines that then completely took over the, the process. But today, Tesla's manufacturing approach is characterized by the combined efforts of humans and robots, which is described as collaborative intelligence. It merges the unique skills of both robots and human workers into a single process. Tesla's automation teams in the Midwest, US, Toronto, and Germany design each manufacturing process in-house from the equipment that builds vehicle components to the complete installation of a production line. To meet its own ambitions and rapidly growing global demand, between 2020 and 2021, Tesla grew its workforce dramatically and um, expanded operations in China, Germany, and the US with the construction of their massive gigafactories. 
In 2021, the company delivered half a million cars worldwide. Today, Tesla delivers EVs in over 40 countries across four continents and is the world's most valuable car company by net worth. So one of the most novel things about Tesla is the way it sells its vehicles. Tesla uses a D2C or direct to consumer model, which contrasts with the traditional method of vehicle retail where a car manufacturer enters into franchise agreements with individual dealers. By comparison, Tesla established a network of company owned showrooms focused largely on customer education, allowing customers to learn about the vehicles and look at design and package options. These showrooms are typically located in high traffic areas like malls and shopping centers. Tesla opened its first Canadian showroom in Toronto in November of 2012, and 95 cars were delivered in Canada that year. By the end of 2014, the Model S ranked as the second best-selling um, all-electric car company in the country behind the Nissan Leaf. Fast forward to today, Tesla car sales in Canada have been growing rapidly. In 2022, Tesla sold over 45,000 vehicles in Canada, representing an increase of about 86% over sales the previous year, with Model 3 being the best-selling model, followed by the Model Y. Tesla has more than 800 locations globally. There are just 24 dealers, Tesla dealers in Canada, however, as of September, with 10 of those being in Ontario. You used to be able to place an order for a Tesla in the showrooms, but today Tesla has moved the buying experience totally online, which is just one more way they are disrupting the uh, status quo. So what makes Tesla so successful? Ultimately, I think Tesla's success has been based on several factors. The quality of its products obviously plays a big part. Tesla from the beginning has strived for top performance, not just good performance for an EV, but good performance for an automobile. In 2021, they set the record for the fastest lap time for an unmodified production EV on the Nürburgring's North Loop in Germany, with an unmodified Model S Plaid. Aerodynamic optimization is another area where Tesla vehicles uh, do well. They are designed with a focus on minimizing drag from all surfaces. Uh, the 2022 Model S had a drag coefficient of 0 0.208, which is one of the world's lowest for a production car. There are a couple hypercars out there that, that can beat that, but for a production car, that's pretty good. Um, safety is another area where Tesla excels. From Model S through Model Y, each Tesla model has consistently received the highest possible ratings from both US and European safety regulators. Um, I also think the visual appearance of the car is a key factor in its popularity. Uh, Chief Designer Franz von Holzhausen created vehicles with distinctive features that set them apart from other cars on the road, namely their signature flesh door handles, the glass roofs, and panoramic windshields, which are all instantly recognizable um, Tesla trademarks. And I think uh, the last part of what makes Tesla so popular is the Tesla community. Tesla does not spend money on traditional marketing campaigns. They instead rely on word of mouth from their fan base. Um, and that's how they attract new customers. This strategy has been very successful as demonstrated by the large numbers of fans who participate in Tesla owners clubs like many of you here tonight. Um, and fans follow company news across the internet and share their enthusiasm for the brand online and at Tesla meetups. Um, I think probably the closest parallel I can think of would be fans of Apple products, but uh, Tesla fans are their own beast. And um, we joke that their fandom really borders on fanaticism. Tesla also emphasizes fun and humor as essential parts of the brand. They offer unique merchandise that sells out in mere hours. Some of it you can see in this photo here. We have the Tesla tequila, the uh, Tesla surfboard, the Tesla short shorts, the cyber whistle, and of course the cyber quad for kids, which was recalled. 
Um, the vehicles are also full of in-car entertainment. Tesla strives um, to make the experience of owning one of their cars a good one. And I think that strategy is working. So as you can see, um, there is a lot more that is in our exhibition than I have time for tonight. Um, here we touch on some tangential Tesla topics like SpaceX and the Boring Company, um, where we talk about the ways in which Teslas have been employed in those endeavors. The exhibition also takes an in-depth look at Tesla's aims of full self-driving. Um, I've got to say, I worked on this section for quite some time with Tesla engineers. I still don't understand it. It's incredibly sophisticated, incredibly complicated stuff. Um, and it's a bit over my head from an engineering point of view. Um, but I want to leave some time for questions if anyone has any. So I will wrap it up here. And here's my email address. If anyone wants to get in touch with me, I am happy to answer any other questions you may have about the exhibition um, or anything else about the museum. So thank you. Thanks so much, Leslie and Autumn. Um, I'll start us off, I guess, with sort of a, a general question. Do you think, you think Tesla or really the, the modern electric vehicle industry as it exists today could have existed without the lithium ion battery? Could we, could we, you know, could there be a hypothetical world where Tesla's run on nickel irons or something like that? Like, or was it, it was it the battery technology first and then the car? I think from my perspective and in talking with, you know, people that were there for the T0, lithium ion was absolutely key. Um, I think if Elon had taken a ride in a T0 that still had its lead acid batteries, we wouldn't be talking necessarily about Tesla, at least as developed as Tesla is at this stage. Um, that was an absolutely necessary step to make it a viable alternative to gas powered vehicles. But um, would we have arrived at some other possibility? Quite possible. I just think that lithium ion and Tesla converged at the right time at the right place that um, that led to Roadster and ultimately, you know, the models that have followed. But Leslie, do you have any thoughts on that? Only to say that I that I agree with you. All right. Um, second question. Has there ever been a good explanation for why Tesla seems to focus so much, at least nowadays, on sort of two or four door sedan style cars? Why we've never seen really, you know, a, a Tesla coupe or, uh, sorry, Tesla coupe or, uh, you know, a smaller, more compact city style vehicles or the things, you, the kind of design styles you traditionally associate with a small electric car? I think, um, I mean, from my perspective, I think they were really trying to to prove that electric vehicles could um, achieve the same feats, uh, exceed the same feats of gas powered vehicles by trying to step into those places in the market by saying that they could make a fast, good looking, well performing sedan when typically we've seen these smaller cars. As part of the master plan part two, um, they do talk about um, other vehicles, such as a, a very small vehicle that could potentially be self-driving, serve as urban transport, a taxi of some sort. So they are looking at products that can fill every hole in the market. And that included um, cargo transportation with semi, it included Cybertruck, and there, there was talk of a smaller vehicle so that they're really taking every aspect of the market and providing a vehicle for it. But I think that Tesla has been so successful in that they offer the kind of cars that people are driving that are gasoline powered and they offer an alternative to those vehicles. I've got a question from the audience. Um, Richard, I'm, I'm gonna take Richard's question and expand on it a bit. Can you speak to how um, Tesla battery packs are recycled in Canada and in general, or not recycled as the case may be, because I know there are some environmental concerns. I actually am not uh, really sure about that. That's a great question, and I will immediately do my research. Um, I know that 
uh, battery waste is a concern. It is in America as well. Um, how uh, different countries are dealing with that, I'm not. I'm not really. Uh, not really up to date on. Autumn, I'm going to jump in with a question. I'm curious. This is this is related to to your exhibition research and, and visitorship and so forth. What are, what are some of the myths or things say to you about or say to the staff? in the museum, in the exhibit about Tesla things they've seen online or rumors they've heard? Um, what, what are some like preconceived notions that visitors are, are coming in with that you, you need to dispel? Um, I think that a lot of people, for starters, a lot of people think that Tesla started with Elon Musk and that it was sort of an idea that Elon Musk had for an electric vehicle. And we really try to dispel that by tracing its origins back to the T0 and back to AC propulsion and some of their electric drive systems and patents that they created that were used in other vehicles by BMW, uh, Mini. Um, so we try to uh, dis 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 dissuade people from that, that, that thought process. Um, but also, I think that there are big personalities involved with Tesla, uh, namely with Elon Musk. And so people have opinions about Elon for good or for bad. And that translates into their opinions of Tesla for good or for bad. And we really try to outline that what this car company did is really quite remarkable. And that is the work of engineers. That is the work of designers. That is the work of scientists and um you know, aerodynamicists and, and things like that. And so really what they've achieved, um, aside from any of the, of the hype or any of the stories, what they've achieved is remarkable. And I think one of the best things I hear from people coming out of the exhibition, um, and I've heard it on a couple different occasions, is people saying, wow, that was actually really interesting. And, and so that's sort of a backhanded compliment. You know, people go in with a preconceived notion of what they're going to learn about and that we are able to show them something different about battery technology, about full self-driving, about um, motors and tri-motors and, you know, powertrains and chassis and all of these things and that people can learn that part of the story has been really rewarding. Um, Tad's asking how, given that the cars are sort of sold directly, how does test driving work? If you can just go online and buy a Tesla, can you do a conventional Tesla test drive? You can. Um, I'm not super, uh, I didn't talk to the team. We worked very closely with uh, people in all levels at Tesla when we were creating the exhibition. And I was very interested in the direct to consumer sales model. Um, I believe that at the Tesla showrooms, you can do a test drive. Um, question for you, Leslie, from Hendrick. Uh, Hendrick's wondering, uh, you know, say, say 20, 30, 40 years down the line, how easy would it be to restore a barn find Tesla in the same way that nowadays you can restore a barn find Model T, given the, the vastly different technologies involved? It's a fascinating question. I think it's a wait and see proposition. Um, a lot of people thought you know, 40, 50 years ago when they were coming out with all of the plastics and, and such that uh, the cars are gonna be impossible to restore. Um, but if there's a market, then there will be people that fill that market. Um, I can't speak to how available the batteries are going to be. I know that uh, the question about recycling is a good one. Uh, I know that, um, you know, the recycling for computers and whatnot, and I think it's just going to be a, a probably a, a large, uh, that, but on a larger, on a larger scale. Um, but like, and I'll leave, I'll leave the question with this. Um, like with anything, you've got to keep these cars going. We've had cars, um, I'll say a Tesla competitor um, in our, in our vault that we didn't touch for a while and couldn't get inside of it. Uh, or figure out how to get into it for a week. Uh, and that has nothing to do with the savvy of our people and everything to do with the limitations of the vehicle. So you've got to keep them going. You've got to keep them charged up, uh, i.e. on life support. 
Uh, Gary is pointing out uh, that Tesla has a lot of connections in, in the Canadian battery technology industry out uh, there. Research Lab has worked with Dalhousie University. Uh, they have subsidiaries in Richmond Hill, near Toronto, in Mississauga, uh, and yes. in Markham. Um, but he's wondering, are there any other, other Canadian connections you know about in terms of uh, Tesla and its network of subsidiaries or the production of the vehicles? I'm not sure uh, if Tesla Energy, which is a subsidiary of Tesla Motors, has any branches that are in Canada. But I do know that the manufacturing process, Toronto, is a is a center where um, they build the uh, build the machines that build the machine um, that work extensively with the auto automation process. Um, but again, being Los Angeles based, I'm a little less informed about Teslas in Canada than I would like to be. Um, so I would have to get back to you on that. Uh, another question from Tad that I, I must confess, now I'm wondering about this because he's asked it. Um, why such a comparatively range, dull range of colors on these cars? If their whole goal is to get, get EVs out there, why do they mostly seem to come in gray or black? That is a very good question and one I have always wondered about because I am attracted to colors. Um, I will say that in California, you do see some pretty creative colors. People obviously have them repainted because uh, California is, Southern California in particular is Tesla Central. You do have an opportunity to see them in matte pink and sparkly green and in a variety of colors that really seem to me like they would sell well, that it would be a selling point to have other than the blue, the red, the white, the gray, and the black. Um, I guess their thinking is that the cars sell themselves um, based on their performance. It could also be that if you can afford a Tesla, you can afford to have it painted. Or wrapped. Or wrapped. I see in California, there are definitely a lot of wraps, you know, iridescence and a, a wide variety. And they really look spectacular in some of these colors. So I know that if a Tesla were to be in my future, so would a wrap or a paint job. It bears mentioning, I think, uh, that California is a very different place, Southern California. You wear your car like you wear an outer layer of clothing in any other um, major city on the East Coast. You put on your car in California, uh, and pink is great. Um, highlighter green is just fantastic. Uh, highlighter green doesn't play as well in Boston um, or, or other uh, neighborhoods, uh, similar, similar neighborhoods. Uh, it's it's a very strange slash uh, interesting slash funky funky approach to automobiles that we have here. Not wow. me, but <laughs> I jump, I'm going to jump in with a question. Uh, oh, I have a personal question. Sorry, go ahead, Alex. Uh, well, we're we're getting more Q and A's, and so this is like a I, I, from a museum point of view, this is like a brand new topic, right? So this yes. this this topic is less than twenty years old. Um, you need a few years to work on it. Um, is there anything that Peterson's ever done that's so recent? I mean, the, the entire topic is in the 21st century. Uh, how, did, is... how did you get permission? How did you, what was your timeline? Did you, like, what kind of permissions did you need from Tesla itself? Because everything's brand new still. Right, right. So this is definitely, we've done single mark shows, absolutely. But these have been historical marks that have, you know, 100 years of history behind them or, um, you know, shows that are that feature a range of marks. So this was the first time doing anything so recent as opposed to including a more recent vehicle in a broader show. Um, but we felt like this company has... Um, exceeded so many benchmarks um, that it really has like this broad history behind it because they achieved so much in such a short period of time. The exhibition is in our Mullen Gallery on our first floor. It's our largest gallery and it is filled. Every square inch of that show is filled. So it has a storied history even being so young. Um, in terms of the timeline, we started speaking with people at Tesla um, probably two years in advance, but the actual, like, you know, meat of working on the exhibition, it took about a year. And um, we worked closely with Franz von Holzhausen's team um, to get access to design images and drawings and um, worked with his team to find out what was available. The I'd say about 90% of the loans 
in the show come from Tesla's own holdings. So the prototypes, the deck models, the you know batteries. And then we worked really hard with our design team um, to create an exhibition that's really visually interesting. So um, the first slide I showed has an exploded Model Y just to illustrate that there are so many fewer uh, components inside an electric vehicle than in a car with an internal combustion engine. So we were able to do these really um, immersive and massive uh, display elements. And we actually worked with Tesla's team to install a lot of those because they are similar to things that Tesla has done at their own unveilings at Cyber Rodeo, at opening of gigafactories, at vehicle launches. You know, they've had these kind of immersive displays. And so we tapped into their knowledge and actually had help from their people to install some of these things. Um, you know, we looked at things that they had done. A Tesla launch is like no other car company launch. It's it's a party. It's this, you know, massive once in a lifetime event. And we wanted to create that sort of feeling that you felt like you were seeing something really special. So the installation process took quite a bit of time, a solid month of being in there every day, all day to get things hanging from the ceiling. Um, and we worked closely to determine the artifacts with the Tesla team. And of course, fact checking, you know, I worked, um, I, my background is as a historian. So I was primarily focused on the story of Tesla. And when it came to talking about how, uh, you know, the battery pack works, I relied heavily on Tesla engineers to, to walk me through those things. I'm going to leap in maybe one more time um, and, and say that the Peterson Museum, any museum exists to serve the public. And what we do is we want to touch on topics that are interesting to people. Uh, sure, Tesla is not, quote, all that old in terms of the automobile. I mean, Daimler-Benz has been around for a very long time, um, much longer than Tesla. But people are interested in Tesla, not that they aren't in other companies, but they're extremely interested, especially Southern California. And they're embraced by Southern Californians um, so much um, to such a greater degree than anywhere else. And we just feel it's a matter of being a responsible uh, community service to the public by addressing what their what what the interest is in today. Thanks, Leslie and Adam. Um, a question from, from longtime uh, seminar attendee Clark. Hi, Clark. Thanks for joining us again. Um, He's wondering, you know, this is not the first time we've seen a, a North American sort of greenfield auto company kind of come out of nowhere, even one with a fairly sort of strong creative lead or figurehead. Of it. I'm thinking of, for instance, um, uh, Tucker Cars back in the 40s and 50s. But is there a sense of what the what the secret sauce is that has allowed Tesla to succeed where so many others with similar backgrounds have failed? gigantic suitcases full of money um it's it takes a great deal of capital to not only develop a car but keep it interesting the next year and the year after that and develop an infrastructure to market it and an infrastructure to service it and in this case an infrastructure to refuel it um this is does uh, uh, elon musk is essentially working from scratch because they're just really before he came along, there was not a um, a lot of uh, you know a, a very good infrastructure, and I just want to mention one thing historically. There was a company in Los Angeles, a guy named Mr. Meyer, developed a um, in the in the 20s and 30s a compressed air car, and his vision was that there would be compressed air gas stations everywhere, and that compressed air would over ultimately overtake gasoline as fuel. So uh, we, we see how well that went over, but what it takes is it, take, it takes somebody with vision, but a realistic vision and a little bit of experience to back it up. Uh, Philip's wondering, given that you both spent so much time working with and at Tesla facilities, do Tesla employees drive their company's cars? Some of them do. Many the of last them time do. I was the last time I was there, the parking lot had a lot of Teslas on it. So But that could have also been visitors to the exhibition who are also Tesla fans. Um I would say some do, uh, depending on their position within the company. They are expensive vehicles. Not everyone can afford a Tesla. I was referring to the Tesla factory. 
Oh, yeah. The Tesla Design Center. Yeah. Yes. At the and Tesla it wasn't Design just Center. Sold cars either. It was licensed road going vehicles. From my understanding, Tesla employees do not get a discount on Teslas, but they do get bumped ahead farther in the line. Maybe I wasn't supposed to say that. Um, question specifically for you, Leslie. Uh, Stephen's wondering, this sort of, uh, and I'll, I'll broaden his question a little bit. Um, do you think any of the, the sort of legacy car makers are catching up or, or how are they doing in terms of sales compared to Tesla? I think modern car companies that haven't built electric cars, which is every one of them, um, have some rethinking to do. Um, they're so invested in how things are currently. Um, they have to have a, a, a complete mind shift from top to bottom because it's, it's not how it's going to be anymore. Um, like I say, electric people, all, it just seems like whenever there's a fuel problem, people turn to electric. It's just a default. And now that it looks like people are taking it more seriously than ever and that it's going to be around far longer than a lot of people thought it would have uh, would ever have been. The companies, they, they have some rethinking to do about their product strategies, about their marketing, about their um, approach to being good community citizens. Okay, one final question. We have about a minute or so left. Um, do you want to do one more question, Beric? Sure. Uh, Richard's wondering, do you guys have a sense of when we're going to start to see Tesla semis on the roads in Canada? Apparently, oh, quite a few of them were pre-ordered in southern Ontario. Oh, that's interesting. I do know that shortly after we opened the exhibition in November, uh, Pepsi Cola in the United States got a, a fleet of semis. I have yet to see one on the road. Um, but I assume that as other companies start to get them, they'll be appearing more and more. We have a um, prototype in our parking garage right now, um, but that's the closest I've been to a Tesla Semi. I'm not really sure what the rollout schedule is for that. I, I think Tesla Semis, it makes a lot of sense because, you know, going back historically, electric power is really good for, for super heavy loads. And obviously, by, by definition, uh, that's how it is. And there's al already um, a people have already demonstrated that they're accepting uh, electric vehicles, companies for deliveries and things like that. There are an awful lot of them out there. Great. So we're about at eight o'clock right now. Um, so I will turn it over to you two for, for final words. I know whenever I give a talk, there's, there's always things I want to say that uh, or come out of, of comments. Um, any, any final final words or, or great stories about Tesla you, you'd like to share with our audience this evening? Um, I think they were very uh, happy to participate. It was a great boon, I think, for them as well as for the museum to be able to share this story. It's brought in a younger audience to the museum to visit the exhibition, which has been really great. And my hope is that um, it does more to change people's minds about electric power. Um, the museum has been telling the electric story for quite some time. We have a dedicated propulsion gallery that looks at the history of electric and alternative uh, power. Um, I think that we'll start to see more and more automotive museums telling this story. And I think it's important and I'm excited to see where these cars go in the future. A super quick addition of that is this isn't our first alternative power exhibit. We've, we've been doing this for decades. Uh, and one of our earliest featured a Tesla, um, the very earliest Tesla Roadster, within the maybe the first six months that they were in business, we were able to borrow one. And uh, not a lot of people held out hope for Tesla back then. They thought, well, here's another upstart. It's going to come and go. Uh, I think Tesla's, in a way, getting the last laugh on that one. Uh, because they're the ones that were able to do it when nobody else has. Great. Well, thank you both for joining us tonight, uh, all the way from California. Um, and if you have any questions, if anyone has any questions, feel free to email us. I know uh, everyone has comments and questions about, about electric cars and Tesla. So this is a topic we are working on always at the Automotive Museum. We just had our exhibit on electric cars last year. Uh, but it will certainly be revisited and it's uh, 
types of cards we're always looking to add to our collection as well. So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, thank you, Autumn. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, thank you, Dumeric, for joining us from a train right now. Um, as planes, trains, and automobiles. Uh, so thank you all and have a, a happy holiday. And we look forward to everyone joining us again in January uh, as we revisit another type of alternative transportation, the horse. So we'll go back to that story, uh, which is, is far more fascinating. The horse lobby is one of my favorite topics. Uh, they did not give up power easily. So uh, we'll talk about that here in Canada and uh, we'll see you then. So thanks again, guys.